you watch some of my videos and now you convince yourself that you need to start stacking 14 different compounds together right from the beginning of your next cycle. And now your start cycle is even more complicated than the instruction manual of a Lego Star Wars Millennium Falcon Ultimate Collector's Edition. Buddy, unless you're competing in a bodybuilding competition or you make money displaying your physique or you make money sharing performance enhancing drug knowledge like I do, then it's completely unnecessary to leverage every little edge you can get out of your performance enhancing drug protocol. So let's bring it down a notch in this video and keep it simple, stupid. Vigor Steve here. In this video, I want to educate you guys how to design your own steroid cycle. But that being said, steroid cycles are a little bit of a thing of the past. And nowadays, most enhanced bodybuilders or enhanced fitness enthusiasts follow a blasting and cruising approach until they're forced to come off cycle to resolve a medical issue or they come off cycle willingly in order to get their partner pregnant. During a blast, there are several phases of where steroid use and overall performance enhancing drug intake is either cycled through or tapered up and down depending on the individual needs and goals. The end of a blast is usually closed off with a blast of oral steroid. So you finish your blast off with a bang after which you're probably in a very poor state of health and you need to transition into a cruise so you can get healthy again. During a cruise, all non-bioidentical hormones are removed entirely and the athlete remains on a dose as close to hormone replacement therapy as possible. This includes exogenous testosterone to make sure that serum testosterone levels stay towards the top of the reference range or slightly superphysiological. This includes human chorionic gonadotropin to sustain testicular function. Yes, HCG is also bioidentical in men, albeit that they produce that in trace, 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 trace amounts. DHEA and pregnenolone supplementation to backfill and support neurosteroid levels for overall cognition, well-being, and memory formation. Perhaps a growth hormone and thyroxine T4 to help with metabolism and help with fullness. And if you're really, really big and you eat a boatload of foods, then I'm not against using exogenous insulin to support your pancreas and make sure that all of those carbohydrates and additional nutrients end up in the right spots, being a skeletal muscle. A bioidentical hormone replacement therapy cruising phase allows you to get healthy again, clean out over the next couple of months, which prepares you for the next blast, which will have incremental phases of increased performance enhancing drug intake, uh, closing that blast off with a blast, with a bang, obviously, uh, before you start to transition into the next cruise again. Generally speaking, looking at the time frame, a cruise might last anywhere between three to four months, and a blast will have several phases, right? We have a um, starting phase of the blast with intermediate drug use, might last three to four months. Then we have a moderate phase where uh, drug use obviously increases. And then the end of the blast might last anywhere between four weeks to eight weeks, maybe 12 weeks if it's leading into a contest prep, where a drug intake is generally a little bit higher to preserve all of the muscle mass that you've built during this off-season bulking phase, quote unquote. Um, again, it highly depends on risk mitigation, harm mitigation, and how healthy you can keep yourself. There's always going to be variables which you need to pay attention to and make adjustments with, but this is the general outline. There's four three-month phases in the year, and performance-enhancing drug intake will go up and down and cycle through, allowing you to make all the gains that you want while staying as healthy as possible. So let's assume you just finished your HRT cruise or HCG monotherapy phase, which takes balls. It's not for the faint of heart. I'll tell you that. And now you're in a good state of health again. You're ready to start growing. During your cruise, you figured out what the lowest effective dose of testosterone was for you as an individual, where you got to keep all of your size and strength while eating in a slight caloric surplus, perhaps in combination with exogenous growth hormone and insulin and IGF-1 NLR3, if you consider that to be bioidentical. And as long as your blood work parameters improved, you got to keep your size and strength. I'm all for it. Perhaps that dose of exogenous testosterone was one milligram per one pound of body weight or two milligrams per one kilogram of body weight, right? Some people need more, some people need less. It highly depends on how you structure your nutrition and what other performance enhancing drugs you take during your cruising phase. And now the next step is trying to figure out what the highest tolerable dose of exogenous testosterone is, but I already discussed this at length in the video titled Best Weekly Dose of Testosterone. I'll link it at the end of this one. So it could be 250 milligrams testosterone per week, 500 milligrams testosterone per week, 1000 milligrams testosterone per week. Personally, I've gone up as high as 2500 milligrams exogenous testosterone per week. 
one ampule of bear test of iron every single day and two on Sunday. Now at the dose, I felt totally fine, but most people will start to experience side effects along the way as the dosages are coming up. You might get hair loss, you might get gynecomastia, you might get acne, blood pressure increases, mood management problems, lower back pumps, etc., etc., etc. So the whole reason why we slowly and incrementally build up our exogenous testosterone dosages is to be ahead of severe side effects, which would otherwise occur if you go balls to the wall, let's say 1000 milligrams of exogenous testosterone right from the start. It's up to you to mitigate these side effects with better lifestyle choices, following a structured diet, proper health supplementation, intelligent use of ancillaries, where needed, tracking your body weight changes, tracking your blood pressure changes, tracking your blood glucose changes, frequent monitoring of blood work so you can make the adjustments well ahead before terrible side effects start to manifest so you can keep yourself as healthy as possible while dosages go up. So let's say you ended your HRT cruise at 150 milligrams exogenous testosterone per week plus growth hormone plus insulin, everything is completely optimized, you're large and in charge. The next logical step would be to increase your exogenous testosterone from 150 milligrams per week to 250 milligrams per week. 100 milligrams more doesn't sound like it's a lot on paper, but you can increase your insulin and growth hormone intake alongside of that. And when you compare the testosterone increase, it might be an increase of over 50%. If you get a little bit more results, but you're not happy with the results you're now getting, let's increase your calories with 10%. Maybe you were eating 3,500 calories, now you're going to 3,850 calories with a little bit of an increase in performance enhancing drugs. Uh, guess how much progress you're going to be making? It's going to be quite significant. And alternatively, you can also change your training frequency, change your training volume, keeping a couple reps in reserve, maybe scheduling a deload, taking a week of rest. Right? improving your sleep quality, all these things that drug-free athletes have to do to maximize one or two pounds per year, you can also do before you start doubling or increasing the dose of your performance enhancing drug protocol, right? Maximize every vector before, right? Before you start increasing the drugs. This is a surefire method to ensure that you stay as healthy as possible. And if you can keep your drug intake low while optimizing everything else, right, the health supplements, the nutrition, and the training volume, then guess what? At the end of your blast, you do your blood work. You're still healthy as You can close off this blast with four weeks of oral steroid abuse or drug abuse in general, and not put a tremendous strain on your body, but still push past all your previous strength plateaus and gain a significant amount of size before you need to transition into a cruise. So now you're maybe unhealthy four weeks out of the year compared to 12 months out of the year. Anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. So let's reel it back into this dose of 250 milligrams exogenous testosterone per week. You increase the calories by 10%, you'll start making progress again. You're getting stronger, bigger, obviously, but eventually this progress will stall. What is next? Increasing the drugs? Wrong. How about we increase the calories with 10% again? Sucks, right? It's boring, right? But this way, you stay healthy. You can probably get three, four, maybe even five caloric increases by 10% steps before you need to up the dose. So Steve, when can we up the dose then, you f***ing asshole? Well, it's very simple. When the food is making you fat and you're no longer making progress, ultimately you're going to get a little bit fatter with each caloric increment, obviously, duh. That's what happens when you're in a caloric surplus chronically. Let's say you're getting fatter, right? You're getting a little bit fluffy, but strength and size is no longer improving. You're hitting this plateau, you're not getting stronger, you can't get any more reps, you're following progressive overload and you've done everything already to modulate your recovery to the best of your abilities. Now, you have 100% my permission to bump up the dose with, let's say, 50%. 250 milligrams exogenous testosterone to 375 milligrams per week. And if that's not enough for you and you have a lot of experience, feel free to increment with a single ampule of testosterone instead. So you go from 250 to 500 milligrams testosterone weekly, right? It's doubling the dose. I prefer 50% increases, but of course, if you're on a gram of steroids already, you increment to the next 1500 milligrams. So it highly depends on how much experience you have and what your upper tolerable dose of exogenous testosterone is, because at one point in time, the dose of testosterone will require you to either use an aromatized inhibitor or add in 
a reversely binding dihydrotestosterone derivative like primobolin or mastrone or boldenone or dihydrobaldenone to prevent the conversion of testosterone into estradiol. You can't solely rely on exogenous testosterone and not put aromatized enzyme inhibition in place. Um, so you need to do blood work frequently, let's say four weeks into this dose increase to see where your serum estradiol levels are at. Check your lipids, check your liver enzymes, check whatever else you want to do, but at least check your serum estradiol levels to make sure that those are still favorable, are not giving you acne, are not giving you gynecomastia. And if they are getting uh, towards that uh, highest level of comfort, look into aromatized enzyme inhibition with aromatized inhibitors or some sort of a testosterone derivative that prevents the conversion of testosterone into estradiol temporarily. And this aspect of step-by-step -step cycle design is so individual. That's why it's so important to do your blood work frequently because you don't know how you're going to respond if this is your first rodeo of increasing the testosterone to a level where you start to get uncomfortable. And I still think it's very important for you to know how you respond to higher dosages of exogenous testosterone simply by controlling serum estradiol levels with an aromatized inhibitor and not put any of the other anabolic androgenic steroids in the picture um, because those are ultimately going to give you different side effects which need additional side effect management. Before you start adding any of these in, let's have a look at the unique characteristics of each anabolic androgenic steroid, how they compare to the other steroids and what makes them different from each other. I'll put it on the screen right now. We'll slowly scroll through it. Take notes, we'll probably do a separate video on the unique characteristics of each anabolic androgenic steroid separately compared to the other ones. Keep in mind that compound selection alongside exogenous testosterone highly depends on the side effects you experience from testosterone alone at various dosages. So again, get some experience with testosterone first before you start adding in any of these other compounds. Because if you already have high hematocrit or high red blood cell count on testosterone only, then maybe primabolin or boldenone or even trembolone and androdrol might not be for you unless you already learned how to control your hematocrit and red blood cell count through the various steps of testosterone increases. And if you experience acne or severe water retention or symptoms of gynecomastia or your mood is taking a turn for the worst and your libido is all over the place, then maybe you're not good at estrogen management on your testosterone only cycle and nandrolone, tristolone, dianabol are probably not good ideas to add on top of your testosterone base. Or you need to prevent that with the non-aromatizing steroids that inhibits aromatization, which coincidentally are also not good for your hairline. So if you experience acne or hair loss and you really care about your hair, then it's probably not a good idea to incorporate a steroid with estrogen management benefits because those are terrible for hair loss. And you might even need to look into a nandrolone only cycle with a Dianabol base or a DHEA and pregnenolone base or HCG monotherapy base or low dose TRT base. So you have sufficient levels of estradiol, but I'm honestly not a real fan of these protocols. So um, please go to another part of the internet if you're interested in nandrolone only cycles. And lastly, if your lipids were unmanageable on testosterone only, then oral steroids like Winstrol, for example, are also not a good idea. You need to learn how to mitigate all of these side effects on testosterone only before you start shopping around and start adding other anabolic androgenic steroids in your step-by-step -step cycle design. And if you do have experience, you know exactly what your body likes and doesn't like, then instead of increasing the dose of testosterone systematically, why don't we add in another compound up to your preference? And once you've selected and decided on a compound to run alongside exogenous testosterone, then the process starts right from the beginning, trying to figure out what the lowest effective dose for you as an individual is and what the highest tolerable dose is, again, with the testosterone base. And you might even need to reduce the dose of testosterone with several increments, to ensure that the side effects that you get from the compound that you run alongside of your testosterone base are mitigated as well. Just because you get synergy regarding the growth of new muscle tissue also means that you might get synergy regarding side effects like I discussed earlier. So to help you in your decision-making process to figure out what the lowest effective dose and the highest tolerable dose is of various anabolic androgenic steroids, I'll put them on the screen. Let the scroll roll and then you can decide where to start and where you might end up at. Regarding the total dose of weekly anabolic androgenic steroid intake, the adjustments that you need to make going forward besides the caloric increases, again, once you get fat on a particular dose, 
you have my sole permission to increase the dose with one increment, and whether that's 50% increment or an increment of, let's say, 250 milligrams per week from a 250 to 500 or 500 to 750 or 750 to 1,000 milligrams per week, that's entirely up to you. And feel free to increase your growth hormone intake to match this increase in steroid intake. Whatever you decide, keep everything the same besides your performance enhancing drug protocol so you can slowly but surely start to recomp now that the dose is increased. So let's say you go from 375 to 500 milligrams anabolic androgenic steroids, a weekly dose combined with, let's say, two to three, I use a growth hormone and however many units of insulin you take to match your diet. You keep the diet exactly the same, but because the drugs went up, your strength and size went up, your metabolic rate increased, and you might be able to recomp as you're making progress still. So you ended up fat as fat. And now you wanted to bump up the dose. The dose went up. And in this difference of metabolic rate, you start to recomp. Free fat loss while still making gains. Isn't that great? Dude, and now you get to look better and get stronger at the same time. But of course, eventually that effect will start to wear off and you need to increase the calories with 10%. Again, now you get another three to four, maybe even five caloric adjustments for this increased dose of performance enhancing drugs that you're now on. But of course, eventually you start to stall again on this particular performance enhancing drug protocol. It doesn't matter how much more food you eat, the food is just going to make you fatter and softer without making you gain exercise or strength. We have the green light to up the dose again, keeping the food exactly the same, allowing us to recomp and making sure that we have better body composition, making us a little bit lean, leaner while getting increasingly stronger and bigger. When that wears off, you increase the food again. And this is the true meaning of step-by-step -step cycle design. You have several phases of caloric adjustments and one step of increasing your performance enhancing drug intake with blood work in between so you can keep yourself healthy before the dose increases. So with all of that being said, most bodybuilders during the off season will only need 500 milligrams at most 1000 milligrams of steroids combined per week if they leverage growth hormone, thyroxine, T4, insulin, perhaps IGF-1, LR3 or DES, right? Whatever they prefer or a combination of testosterone and other anabolic androgenic steroids, the weekly dose during the off season usually ends up anywhere between 500 milligrams to 1000 milligrams per week. And then towards the end, you can finish this off-season blast off with a blast using oral steroids, maybe ending up at, let's say, 750 milligrams to 1,500 milligrams anabolic androgenic steroids combined per week. Now, when you transition into a cutting phase, um, you continue with the same thing, but the caloric adjustments slowly go down, and thus performance-enhancing drug intake generally has to go up to compensate for the lack of anabolism now that you're taking calories away. As a reminder, foods, highly anabolic. Sleep, highly anabolic. And of course, performance enhancing drugs are also highly anabolic if you structure them well. Um, but if your caloric intake goes down, you need to increase your protein synthesis. You need to increase your nitrogen retention, mineral retention, electrolyte retention, and uh, glycogen retention with increased amounts of anabolic engine steroids, growth hormone, insulin, whatever else. If you want to improve your cosmetic appearance, um, of course, in this reduction of caloric intake, you need to prevent muscle protein breakdown also. And again, generally speaking, a higher dose is required. And please understand that with step-by-step -step cycle design, there's a tremendous amount of flexibility involved. You need to listen to your body, whether you do that with blood work or taking progress pictures or simply writing in your diary how you feel. If you feel off from a particular dose of steroids or a particular combination of steroids, compound XYZ, just take it out. Do the blood work, get the data, make the appropriate adjustments. There's always an alternative method towards your goals, right? But if you have the data and you understand how these compounds work individually by going through the steps of what I outlined during this cycle, do you know exactly what to do, what to take out, what adjustments to make, and stick with the most sustainable and healthy protocol, which is ultimately the best steroid cycle for you as an individual. And really guys, designing an entire steroid cycle out weeks in advance is probably the dumbest thing you can do. If you knew exactly how your body was going to respond or how things were going to play out, then you would be a master stock trader or cryptocurrency trader with Nostradamus-like insights. You need to be dynamic and adjust 
based on biofeedback, ideally on a week-to-week -week basis. And again, it doesn't have to mean that you need to increase the dose or add in all of these compounds week-to-week, -week, but at least make some caloric adjustments or some changes to your training volume or overall training protocol. You start somewhere, you make the adjustments where needed, and you end up somewhere, but by the end, you should look pretty damn good with good blood work to match. That's the ultimate goal, right? I mean, the cycle is only as good as the results that you get from it, but if you don't get any results and you're stubbornly suffering through all of the side effects, then why are you doing it, buddy? And if you don't know how to do that at the end of watching this video, just hire an experienced coach who can make the adjustments for you. But if this coach lays out a cycle 16 weeks, 20 weeks in advance, ask for your money back, that is not the way you design a step-by-step cycle. All right, to summarize, figure out what the lowest effective dose and highest tolerable dose of exogenous testosterone is, see where you need an aromatized inhibitor, see which other compounds you would like to add on top of your testosterone base before you increase the dose of your weekly anabolic androgenic steroid intake, increase the food first, once, twice, three times, four times, five times, until you get fat but are no longer making progress, then you have my permission to increase the dose with 50% or by adding another 250 milligrams anabolic androgenic steroids combined per week. Then you recomp based on this increased dose while keeping the caloric intake exactly the same. Maybe your body fat levels come down with one or 2%, but you get stronger, you get bigger, and ultimately you get leaner, you start to look better. But once you start stalling and you're sufficiently lean again, then you increase the calories once, twice, three times, four times, maybe even five times. If you get fat, you're no longer getting bigger, you're no longer getting stronger, then the dose goes up again. It's not rocket science. It's so simple. Just keep progress pictures, keep track of your weight, keep track of your blood pressure and blood glucose levels, do your blood work, and everything, I promise you, everything will slowly but surely fall into place and you turn out to be a healthy freak, really. All right, thank you guys so much for watching. You can find everything that I'm associated with down below in the YouTube description section. Follow me on Instagram and TikTok at Vigor Steve, Vigor's crew, a front double bicep for you guys. I mean, I was able to get up to 118, 120 kilos on 500 milligrams testosterone, a little bit of growth hormone and a little bit of insulin during the off season, eating a boatload of food. That's pretty freaking big. And guess what? My blood work was beautiful, nicely in range. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.